Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to have with us today Dr. Sandy Barker and Ms. Audrey Warner, who collectively bring with them wealth of experience in business education, in learner-centered pedagogies, and particularly with using simulations as a learning alternative. So Audrey is the co-sig lead of business education SIG of Ascalite, and Sandy comes with her with long commitment with Ascalite. She's on the Ascalite executive. Without further ado, I shall hand over to Sandy and Audrey. Okay, I'm just checking. Audrey doesn't seem to have a microphone yet. Um, so I'm just waiting for uh, her audio to click in. Here we go. All right, yep, sorry about that. That's all right, Audrey. Can you see the slides to move them across? I can see the slides, yes. Yeah, but can you, um, do you have a, a next slide at the bottom of the screen that you I can do. use? Perfect, I'll leave you to it then. All right, thank you very much, Sandy. Thanks, Hush, for your introduction. Uh, my apologies for being a few minutes late. Um, it didn't factor in daylight savings, so I still thought I had another hour, so bear with me. Um, so I'm delighted now to present to you using simulations as a learning uh, alternative, presented by myself, Audrea Warner, and Dr. Sandra Barker. What we'd like to cover with you over the next um, 50 minutes or so is to give you a bit of an overview of what is actually a simulation, the context within which we use the simulation for our tertiary environment, um, why we use simulations, you know, what's so great about them that people are, are using these simulations and have been using them for quite some time. Nothing is perfect, so we also have to look at the issues of using simulations and how to achieve effective teaching with those simulations. It's not just about kind of using a simulation and hoping it kind of fits in around what else we're doing, but really making sure that integration is there. And also the factors to consider in terms of assessments that we're also doing that scaffold the learning of our students. So what is a simulation? As the slide you can see says, a simulation is a form of experiential learning. It is a strategy that fits well with the principles of student-centered and constructivist learning and teaching, especially that we follow with the Graduate School of Management at the University of Auckland. Simulations take a number of different forms. So I'm just gonna to talk to you very quickly in terms of what the simulation that I use involves. It's called Mike's Bikes. It's run by Smart Sims, who've been around for a good 20 plus years. And the idea of the simulation is that students come together and are pre-assigned into a team and they work on a fictional uh, bike company and they compete against other student-led companies across the globe. And they're also put into regions such as America, North America, Asia and so forth. The idea overall of the simulation is to get students to think strategically and we'll kind of go and break down over the course of the next while about all the other different things that we try to do with our simulation. The other thing is I need to give you a little bit of context within which we use the simulation. So as I said, I teach in the Graduate School of Management. My primary area is in the taught masters, which is in the business masters program. This is 15 months or 18 months. And the core course, or one of the core courses that we have is called Managing People and Organisations. So within that course, we have the simulation running called Mike's Bikes. Our cohorts of students are around about 180 to close to 200, give or take. Within the undergraduate program, the simulation has also been running for over 20 years. And within the taught masters, it's been running for seven years, of which four years I've been involved in. The dynamics of the cohorts that we have are they're predominantly international students, English as a second language, so there's lots of other things that we also need to factor when we are using the simulation as well. So I hope that gives you kind of an idea of the context in which how we use that simulation for our taught masters. So why do we use the simulation? The simulation provides students with that hands-on learning. It enables them to really get their hands dirty. And there's a really nice quote that I wanted to share with you in regard to this. And it's by Professor Amy Edmondson. And she's from Harvard Business School. And she writes the following. A simulation requires action and decisions. Students are right in the mix, having experience as opposed to reading about an experience. And I think 
that's really important for our students. A lot of the time we get them to read cases and you know really break those down and here they're actually applying those theoretical concepts and ideas and Sandy will kind of go into a bit more of that in her part of today's webinar. The utilization of business simulations has really been going. So Faria in 2008 had some uh, interesting literature that came out that talked about the AACSB uh, accredited business schools and it was noted that 97.5% of those use simulations within their program. So that I thought was quite an outstanding amount. I haven't been able to find any more recent literature on that but to see that being used shows there's definitely value there that people can see. The majority of simulations that we use are designed to help students gain that understanding. It's bridging between that theory and the practical side. It's giving them the opportunity to get their hands dirty while also being put into a safe environment where they're really able to um, try different things and learn from that. So some of the other really important things that I personally think that why we use simulations is that cognitive outcome. So some of the things about providing an environment in which students can experiment with different strategies. It's adopt different roles. Going back to the Mike Spike simulation that we do, students are assigned into roles. They are first put into a single player scenario where in the first week they need to learn about the simulation and they're playing against a computer. Then we move from that to get them to fill team application roles. So they might say, for example, there are six different roles, CEO, CFO, um, operations manager, HR, you've got marketing and you've got R&D. So they get to rank the top three that they would like to be in and we then look at the different demographics, whether that's gender, ethnicity, and try and put them into as much multicultural and diverse teams as possible. So they really get those experiences that they're going to feed into, into the real business world. So my thing about simulations is that they provide a collaborative work environment for students, and that collaboration is really important. It enables students to construct, as well as reconstruct and co-construct their knowledge and understanding. It encourages problem solving. Even this morning, I had a situation where a student of mine is struggling with her aspect of the simulation, and it's about working through that and providing that support network there for students to be able to understand the simulation, but also understand the dynamics of the teams that they're working in as well. Simulations help students to connect theoretical concepts and ideas, as I mentioned earlier, to those real world situations. So it's about applying strategy, looking at the underlying assumptions about why something's actually happening. Is it that you're being very reactive and maybe your company and your team should be more proactive in how they're approaching the strategies that you're taking? But with cognitive outcomes also come behavioral outcomes that we want students to get out of these um, simulations. So simulations are powerful tools in promoting teamwork and team dynamics, as I mentioned. Social and emotional skills are really, really important. And just having those skills is valuable to take into the workplace. So again, collaboration and interaction. But also a really big thing is we see this growth in leadership. So those that weren't confident about taking on a CEO role grow immensely over the 10 weeks that we have our students to really see those skills develop, to manage different conflicts and dynamics within their teams themselves. So again, the value of simulations is we're really trying to equip them for the future. It also ties in with our own graduate profiles where we're trying to get our students to be um, really educators and innovators. We're trying to get them to be global citizens and I feel simulations provide those opportunities quite well. As I said at the beginning, nothing's perfect. So let's now have a, a look at some of the things that um, I've kind of noticed are some of the issues with simulations from my own experience. And, and one of the big things is resources and time. When you have students of about 180 to 200 students, and this can be scaled up, as I said, in the undergraduate, it's been running for over 20 years and you have larger cohorts. Um, I don't find as much that they provide the kind of scaffolding that I've developed, and I'm just going to talk about that briefly. What I do with the simulations is um, after we finish with a cohort, 
normally I'll look at those that got A and higher in over the course of our paper and I'll approach them and ask them to be peer mentors for the next iteration. The idea here is that we train the peer mentors to come in. They're not there to give the answers and often you do get that pushback from the new students that they just want the answers. They want to know what they're doing. But really the peer mentors are there to kind of remove that power distance that exists between myself and the students. They find it very challenging to come and ask me a question. But if you put somebody who's already done the paper and the simulation before with them, they find that that's a different way of kind of breaking down those barriers. So it's in that way, it's quite intense. There's a lot of scaffolding, a lot of foundational work that needs to be done to make sure the sim runs smoothly. There's a lot of liaising between Mike's bikes, I'm um, sorry, smart sims, in terms of making sure that they know all the rollover dates and different things that are part of the simulation. So in terms of that, it does come with a lot of developing solid foundation before you can kind of build up, but there's so much value to it, I feel. Some might say that, you know, students forget the value of the educational purpose of the exercise. I can say to you in those first few weeks, especially in the first week, you see the gamers. You see those that think, I can game this and I can get a really good mark for the simulation component of this course and I can come out with a top grade. They soon learn very quickly that gaming can take them so far if they don't understand the really intricate nature of the simulation and how it plays out and all the other components that we want them to kind of gain from it, that they are going to miss a huge chunk of their learning and understanding. So that's something I think you need to make really clear from the beginning, whether it's in the discussions that you have with the students. So I normally bring in a Q&A panel of previous students and get them to talk about their experiences, what they've learned, what they tell their um, first time and they were using the simulation, what they'd go back and say if they had a time machine kind of scenario. I know that our simulation runs as a competition, but I think the big thing that I find with our students is that there are still a lot to be learnt without winning the simulation. So even if your team doesn't become top of the simulation, there's so much that students can learn and gauge from it, both about themselves, their peers, the theoretical concepts, it's kind of a ripple effect, if you like. There's a vast amount that then feeds into, into what they gain over those 10 weeks. So yes, I'm definitely going to say there are challenges, but if anyone is keen and eager to try the simulation of any kind, I'm more than happy to lend a hand in that regard to, to help with any setup and anything like that. So now, how do I achieve um, effective teaching with the simulations? I've touched on that. I do use the peer mentors that I've um, started and created um, through my own course. But the other things that I think are really, really paramount, and there are three of them that you need to consider. Who are my learners? You know, for me, my learners are predominantly international students. English is a second language. They're already juggling a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things that are new. You need to understand what kind of background they may have and that's one of the reasons we have the role applications so we get to find out if somebody has been doing marketing or if they've got an engineering degree as an undergrad so are they a bit more analytical and more focused maybe they want to be R&D in their team so it's really understanding your learners and also understanding how wide the gap is between kind of what you want them to know and what they need to know so this also ties into my second point which is what are they learning and we have a learning designer who very much is, sits right through our whole process. And the value of our learning designer is that she enables us to see, here's your course outline, here are your objectives that you want to look at and, and achieve, and then here are the graduate profiles. So to make sure all assessments and everything are very clear to students, and that's really important. After doing the simulation myself for seven years, it's easy to become like, Blase or have this attitude that you kind of expect students to naturally fall into a certain, oh, they should understand that. It's not always the case. And I think, especially with COVID, and I, I, I think that has to be raised, we've become a lot more aware of being more explicit um, rather than implicit, where we've done that with kind of face to face, more quick, casual conversations. It's much more um, explicit about what it is that we want done. What are the expectations in terms of the sim? How does it map this maps to what we're teaching that week? 
a lot more um, explicit understanding needs to be made. And then also understanding how students learn. It's very easy to assume that just because you have um, master's level students that they're all going to have the same mindset and be able to absorb and adapt and, and do everything the way you kind of expect them to. So understanding that previously they weren't asked to justify or to really look at the underlying issue that was with the decision that they made. So say for example they've decided to pay off all their debt. Fantastic, you're debt free. But now if you need money to expand your factories, you don't have any money. So it's about really thinking about what they need to learn. And finally, I'm just going to um, note here about what you need to consider um, about what to assess. We were very assessment heavy, and I'll be honest with that. Starting on this program, and in particular the course that I was on, it was about eight pieces of assessment, and it was really, it was a lot. So we have over the last four years tried to kind of streamline and narrow that down quite a bit. We have 30%, 35% of our assessment is around the simulation itself and we have 65% which is not directly related to simulation. So it enables students to feel that they can still do well in, the, in our course and in our program without necessarily if they don't still feel comfortable with the simulation. We still try to show across lots of value. We have board meetings around week seven where students need to tell us the narrative of what have you been doing as a team in the simulation? What are the things that you've learnt? Um, where are you seeing yourselves going over the next three weeks that are left? Are you going to acquire a company? Are you going to get acquired? Do you see yourself wanting to do X, Y, Z? Kind of explain that story to us. And if things have gone badly, do you know why they've gone badly? So those are the really important things. Um, I'm going to just talk very briefly now about some of the other points that I've got written down here. Um, yes, <laughs> thank you, Laura. I, I agree with the statement about the blight of, of all our disciplines. Um, are there desired instructional outcomes well defined? And I think over, as I said, over the last six months, I think I've become more clearer in what I'm saying. Before, there was huge assumptions that I was making about how clear I was saying things in class and how the guidelines were. But when you are not getting that one-on-one -on -one as much as you probably would or the reactions that you normally would when you're standing in front of a class and you're having all these screens in front of you instead, then it's been a real necessity to get that there as well. Also, just understanding that students sometimes are not going to ask questions. So setting up a Google Doc where they can just draw any of their questions or anonymously ask um, questions through our Canvas, which is where we have um, the answer, where they can actually just put in questions anonymously and have them answered as well. Problem solving is something that we have really tried to make sure that that comes through, that students understand the issues that they've had um, through their learning in the simulation, they're able to articulate that through their, their written. Um, so we include them uh, to have in the midterm test, uh, draw upon examples from your Mike Spike simulation. So we can see they can connect the two. And then again, as I said, the board meetings are really important. We try and end the quarter, our 10 weeks, with a fun presentation where they're able to show us the narrative of where were they were at the beginning and where they are now. And the purpose of that is to really show them how they've grown and also for them to convey to us that they understand the growing journey. And it doesn't really end there. It's going to keep going as they go through the rest of the program. Well, I'm going to now hand it over to Sandy. Um, Sandy, can you, I haven't done this before, so can I get, um, Hush, could you show me how I'm meant to now give access to Sandy? Or Sandy, can no, you just? It's all good. I have access. Brilliant. So um, thanks, Audra, and it's really interesting listening to your um, take on uh, on how uh, you use uh, simulations. Um, so I uh, have used simulations now for the last 11 years. Um, I teach it with undergraduate business students across all disciplines. The course I take is an elective course, so it's not core. Uh, to any one program, students take it as an elective and at the moment we offer it in an intensive mode in our winter school uh, and in that scenario um, they have three weeks uh, 
two days a week, two whole days a week, uh, in, immersed in the simulation. We don't teach any other um, theory around it. It is purely around the experience of running a business. I use the CAPSIM simulation, which has been around since 1998. And at UniSA, we've been using CAPSIM or the CAPSTONE version uh, from CAPSIM for um, since 2010. And um, since then, we've had multiple cohorts work through. Um, it's nice, we keep uh, tight classes of maximum of 36. Um, but we run multiple classes across those uh, winter school offerings. It's fairly hectic and fairly daunting up front for the students. And um, in that, they, um, uh, they <coughs> have a lot to learn up front. We set them up immediately in cross-disciplinary teams. We try to have at least one finance or accounting student across each team uh, and uh, uh, a range of disciplines from logistics and supply chain, uh, HR, marketing. Uh, we even have tourism and hospitality and um, sport and recreation students taking this course as well as uh, management of IT students. So we have quite a wide range of disciplines uh, that, uh, take up course and opportunity. The reason we use the simulation is very um, similar to the way uh, it uses it because it provides that safe learning. Millions of dollars without worrying they're going to put themselves in. So CAPSIM are really keen, you know, bridge the gap between theory and and what you'll see in some of my quotes at the end uh, of the presentation is that students have identified this. Certainly increases student engagement. Um, during COVID this winter school, we ran it as an online simulation, even though at UniSA we were moving back to uh, in the classroom scenario. We're fortunate here in, in South Australia to be able to do that. Um, unfortunately, the social, the distancing that we were able to use didn't uh, encourage teamwork around the one computer so we moved it to the online environment for the first time and it worked really really well um, using Zoom with breakout rooms, students with teams in their breakout rooms and um, I had the best ever results that I'd ever have. Uh, so the engagement was um, phenomenal in that respect and always is. We get in the classroom, we end up with massive discussions uh, at the end of each simulated year. We um, debrief on how everybody's gone. We look at um, who's won certain KPIs, uh, where people might have fallen in the hole. And there becomes a real banter, particularly if um, students who are friends who've taken the course as, as friends end up in different teams, you end with some quite interesting banter around the room. Um, certainly it encourages the real world positive. Students are uh, in CAPSIM, they're making uh, sensors for uh, a variety of different customers of five different uh, markets in the sensor market and uh, students all start out at the same platform. Uh, the same level, the same amount of money in their account uh, and uh, the same type of sensors with the same specifications. And then they choose the strategy where they want to take the company. And uh, it certainly uh, becomes very real world, particularly where you end up with one particular market that might have 10 different offerings and then you have another market where there might only be two companies competing in that market. Uh, and they're the ones that often tend to do quite well because there's no other competition and they can make a huge uh, profit margin in those markets. Uh, a few, a um, couple of years ago now, I took the assessed, uh, the students are assessed on um, uh, their performance on the balanced scorecard. They're also um, assessed on or KPI. They choose and themselves. There's a that they can choose from, and as a team, 
I look about halfway through the simulation and identify the, the key performance indicators that they want their business to concentrate on and then they um, work accordingly and that becomes part of their assessment. So if they don't perform so well on the balance score case, still can perform well because they've chosen which way they want their company to go. Uh, individually, at the end of the, the intense period, students actually um, undertake the simulation on an individual basis to show that there's been no lurkers in the team environment. And uh, they run a cut down version of the simulation themselves over an intense period. Um, uh, previously, when we ran it face to face, this was an invigilated um, running of the simulation and they had three hours to complete it. With the uh, COVID situation uh, this year, we couldn't do face to face invigilated and so we ran it over a longer period of time. Uh, because students had work commitments and so on and we had to allow them to work when they could in this current state that we were in. And we um, uh, ran it over a much longer period and the students uh, still only stayed in for about the three hours uh, that uh, we normally allowed. So it really was uh, very little difference. So they're also assessed on their performance in uh, the individualised uh, version of the simulation. The last thing they're assessed on is we get them to reflect. Um, I should say they also do a team presentation uh, as how well their team, um, team performed and where they're going strategically in the future, which means they can't game out at the end of the process because they, uh, they have to show the board of directors that the company is a viable company. So we get very little gaming in that respect. But the last thing they do is a reflection on what they've learned. And uh, last year at the Ascolite conference, I presented uh, the first of some research that, um, uh, that I'd done with a colleague where we took the student reflections, part of which was asking what they personally had learnt from the simulation and we did a um, analysis of those in a uh, uh, anonymised form. We had all of the assessments anonymised. We um, entered all the data, <coughs> excuse me, and um, brought out the theme. And five key themes that came out of uh, what students said they learnt were, um, I'm going to start in the middle here with business operations. and the key thing they talked about was what they didn't realise studying an individualised discipline in business was how interconnected all the departments were. If I spend money in my market budget, it's going to affect how much money there is available for production. In production, if I spend money in new equipment, it's going to affect the amount of money that's available for the marketing team to be able to market the product. So, there was a lot of uh, commentary around how interconnected their um, departments really were and how they didn't realise um, uh, how interconnected they were. They also commented on how important it is to be able to invest, uh, to be able to plan for the future uh, and decision making. How important it was to be clear in the decision making process and if you weren't sent then that's where the business could fall into problems for that particular year. In terms of uh, knowledge, students thought about how they had learnt to apply their existing knowledge that they'd learnt through two and a half to three years of their study uh, in business. They also talked about the lack of knowledge they had about different areas and how they didn't, rely, uh, didn't um, understand some of the theory that um, was being presented in the simulation because they hadn't, they may not have studied it in their discipline. And as such, they talked a lot about relying on the knowledge of others and um, how good cross disciplinary teams were because um, they could talk to the others in that group and use their knowledge uh, 
um, and a lot of them talk building on their first year accounting knowledge from talking with the accounting and finance students within their team. Surprisingly, they also talked about how theory was not always the best. Um, they'd learnt some theory in their um, studies and went to apply it, they found it didn't really work the way they expected it to. So that was a really interesting reflection on uh, the knowledge that they were using. Students that did make mistakes throughout the simulation or teams that made mistakes really talked about how the mistakes impacted the, the company's performance and how if I'd only um, financed that capital expenditure, I wouldn't have gone in the hole and uh, ended up um, having to get a loan for $35 million to cover my excessive inventory costs and lack of cash on hand. But they also talked about how much they learned from those mistakes and part of our future research with this data is to look at uh, the grades that the students got, uh, which has all been documented in the um, uh, in the data set, and compare them to um, what they said they learnt. And if they'd got a lower grade, it generally was because they made a number of mistakes throughout the simulation. Uh, it was not really related to any other reason except if they didn't do the work. Um, and to look at whether they talked about in their reflection about how they learnt from their mistakes and see if there is a correlation. To talk about competitors and how important it was to analyse the performance of their competitors and how when they did do a, a competitor analysis, which is a, an in-class exercise, um, how it impacted on the decisions that they were making in the future once they'd analysed all of their um, current competitors and how they continued to do that um, for the remainder of the simulation. Most importantly, of course, we expect out of a simulation that uh, students will learn those soft skills, employable skills here at UniASA, we now call them enterprise skills. And the things that the students picked up on were obvious teamwork, problem solving, communication, um, but they also talked about conflict management and time management. And uh, we thought that was really interesting when we analysed the data because there was, uh, there can be quite a lot of conflict within the teams uh, in terms of people, um, uh, so finance people wanting to hang on to the money and not borrow um, and not spend so much and uh, marketing people saying, but if we don't spend the money in marketing, people won't know that our product's available, all those sorts of things. And so there is that conflict on a regular basis and a number of students identified that um, conflict management was a skill that they had um, learnt and built up. And because of the intensive nature of the course, time management is almost always um, identified in uh, the list of what students learn. So here's some quotes uh, that have come out of uh, the students. We analysed about 250 or thereabouts students' um, papers. Um, and these were randomised, so I can't say student 16 was back in 2010 because the student numbers were completely randomised. Um, but uh, this student has obviously worked in teams at university, but also um, in the workplace and identified that not only were they a team member, but they built up their leadership skills, which was fantastic. Uh, student 176 talked about seeing balance sheets and income statements in action and, and being able to understand them for the first time uh, and how they would work in life, um, which really did um, uh, make me quite happy that they were seeing the, uh, the benefit of uh, the theory that they had been learning. Um, so, you know, we another student talked about how they'd been taught to communicate and listen and incorporate ideas of others, but the fact that they actually got to use it and see that in, in action was, uh, was quite good. Uh, another student talked about um, seeing how um, the learning had been centred around functions of a business, but uh, this learning um, 
also and looked at the um, how different decisions affected the different areas of profitability in the business. Um, the student here talks about the, the competitor analysis, making it uh, a great way to practically understand content and theory without regurgitating slabs of text and research. They got a, um, commented on how well they were able to apply the theory without actually having to write an essay about it. They thought writing a competitor analysis of a real competitor was quite useful. Um, and this last person talked about um, uh, the fact that the course had prepared them for life outside of university, which um, really yeah, did thrill us in terms of um, the fact that what we were hoping that students were getting out of it, they were identifying, which was fantastic. So. We have run this simulation once as a full semester, 13 weeks, although now our semesters are 10 weeks. Um, and we found the students were really eager to get in to, um, to continue rather than have to wait a week for their results uh, of uh, the decisions they've made. So running it as an intensive for us uh, works really well. As I said, the students at the start are quite daunted with the amount they have to learn very quickly. Um, but once they get over that, that hill, they find that the, um, the learning that they achieve and the experience of uh, the teamwork that they have far outweighs the fact that they're um, quite cramped in that period of time. So I'm going to uh, now open the floor for questions and uh, hope that uh, You've been able to see how we use those simulations and uh, happy to answer anybody's questions. Thank you so much, Mandy and Audria. Please join me in giving a round of applause to both of them for a very engaging presentation. So if you have questions, perhaps you could post them in the chat session. And another, uh, I might get started. So Sandy, as I understand, you use it for the capstones. Do you feel that sims are particularly suitable in a specific kind of stage of a program? Would you see them as being equally useful in the introductory courses? What's your experience been like? Uh, absolutely. I think we need to use simulation more throughout the degree. Uh, certainly at undergraduate, I've looked at a couple of other simulations. Um, uh, strategic management, again, our final year students um, have a three week um, simulation that they run in a team uh, and students who have done strategic management before they come into my course feel they have a bit of a leg up. Um, our marketing students also have a core course that uses a simulation um, and uh, again they find uh, if they come and do mine as well as the elective they have a bit of a, an advantage but they soon find that just concentrating on marketing in a simulation is very different to concentrating on a whole business. But I think um, some of the things I've looked at is where we can use simulation almost as an activity rather than an assessment uh, tool to give the students a bit of a feel. And I think, you know, in this financial way, um, uh, world at the moment, I don't think it's going to be viable unless we can find some free simulations out there. Um, but um, it would be really great to be able to um, have some simulations that students at first year level can see, you know, just get a little bit of a taste and then at second year and then in final year. Um, in the CAPSIM uh, simulation or CAPSTONE simulation, it is, uh, there are um, different um, levels different things that you can throw in there, which make it useful um, at a higher level as well. So you can throw in the, in, in the fifth year of the, of the running of the simulation, you can put everybody into recession and they have to pull themselves out. Um, you can also add in ethical, um, <coughs> uh, uh, ethical situations where they have to make ethical decisions and how that impacts on uh, their customer's view of the uh, 
uh, of the business, so that also impacts on their sales. So there's lots of different things that you could throw in there and talk around uh, in different ways. So we are looking at different ways we can use those simulations. So See, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, so Elaine, uh, just in response to your question, Sandy and Audrea didn't collaborate on their teaching, so, so they reflected on their own experiences of teaching their students. And Sandy, perhaps you and Audrea could respond to Anu's question. How easy or difficult is it to integrate this within a course? And how long does it take to set this up? Shall I take that first, Sandy? Is that all right? Yeah, you go for it first. Okay. Um, so in terms of setting it up in a simulation within a course, I'd say there's a, a quite a bit of groundwork. And I, I don't say that to put anyone off in any way. I know I had the, the luck of having already had it set up when I took the course myself uh, and took the course over um, four years ago. But in saying that, it's constantly evolving. There was lots of room for where you could see that students were just, the assumption was that students need to kind of get on with it. Within the undergraduate sphere, as I said, it's been running for 20 years and it's run almost independently of the course. So a little bit similar to what Sandy does, whereas in the master's program, it's very much integrated into our course. So I would say it's a matter of talking and looking at options that are out there and seeing what providers are offering, offering and then looking at assessments of how you would actually show the link. So let me give you an example. Within the first couple of weeks, uh, first two weeks, we have them get into the teams, but in that getting into the teams, they also have to create a brand pitch. So it brings in that element of marketing, and it also gives some of those students who want to do marketing as a specialization later on in the master's program, the opportunity of learning about marketing principles, logos, um, taglines, all the rest of it that kind of goes with that. It also gives them a sense of identity. So. For me, I would say that it is easy and it's not easy. It depends on how much of the simulation you want integrated into your course. If, for example, as Sandy rightly pointed out, if you want to run it as a kind of one-off um, thing that the students do to kind of get their fingers in there and, and get their hands dirty, I would recommend that as a starting point and seeing how your student um, group actually embrace it and how they find it. And then from there, talking to myself and Sandy, I'm sure we can um, come up with uh, other ways that we could um, help you with some other ideas as well. Sandy, over to you. Yes, yeah, so um, our course was the, with the use of Capstone was set up um, primarily uh, as part of our student engagement project. It was a uni-wide project in, in 2009-2010. And um, at, at the business school, decided that what it wanted to do was to um, incorporate some form of experience uh, as a whole uh, that was safe and available to uh, lots of people uh, and as such we um, built the course around the simulation. So as I said earlier, we don't bring in any new theory. Um, students have to have completed all of second year to um, enrol in the course so they should have a good foundation of theory. It's only run in winter school which is in the middle of uh, their final year which means hopefully they've done two and a half years uh, and this is leading up to their final semester of study. Um, and we work the, the uh, looked at the core courses that they take and tried to bring in elements of that into the use of the simulation so that um, we could see that across all disciplines, students were being able to use the theory they had learnt uh, as part of their studies. Um, and this generally uh, is the case. There's a couple of situations where it's the case. Um, and, still, and as I said, we've been running this now for 11 years and as Audra's moving constantly looking at how to simulation gets updated, how are you going to incorporate some of those changes and so yeah, it's about what you want to achieve out of using a simulation just to illustrate the point. Um, so there's a, a simulation out there called Monsoon Sim, which we've been looking at, um, which is um, fabulous and really exciting, um, really fast paced. 
And I would be interested in looking at that with my students that study procurement or logistics and supply chain, because there are elements in that if you don't buy the product quick enough, it's not available for you to sell and so on. And you can integrate that into the theory over a couple of weeks rather than making a whole course around it. So it's about what you want to do with it. But as uh, Audra said, happy to uh, discuss with anybody um, how, uh, uh, how we set it up. And uh, in response to Elaine's question, um, we haven't really started collaborating this much, uh, that much, um, but we are going to be collaborating in the future on um, the use of simulations across and the differences between the two institutions. Absolutely. So just to add to that, Sandy, um, in our accounting major capstone, they're using Monsoon Sim and they've had really good experience. So if you're interested in following up on that, we can connect you with our colleague, Dr. Christine Contesetto, who's leading that. So there seems to be a lot of interest in using SIMS. And one of the things we did try to create on the MS team site for our SIG was try to set up collaborative projects. So as Sandy mentioned, there is a possibility for that. So perhaps do chip in if you're interested in engaging in SIM related research or students experiences of using SIMS. There are lots of interesting trajectories to follow upon. Please join in in a group here. Um, so in terms of uh, Elena's question, um, the SIM that um, Harsh just mentioned is called Monsoon SIM. Uh, and it's one that I saw in action at a uh, pre-conference workshop at last year's Escalite conference. Um, uh, Lorraine asks ways to embed simulation for only part of a semester. Um, certainly, we did that. We, we do that with um, uh, strategic management, which is a core course. Every student has to take it in the business school, and um, I certainly embed that. And it's just done over uh, two to three weeks. So, um, uh, so yes, it's certainly. Uh, uh, easy enough to embed into uh, that and they do assess that as part of the activities. So as we finish up, I just wanted to give a big plug for the um, Ascolite conference. Normally we would be heading off somewhere and this year it was supposed to be in uh, um, at the University of New England, unfortunately at Armadale. Unfortunately, of course, with COVID, um, we've had to go online like everybody else, but we haven't cancelled. We are still going ahead. It'll be run over two days, 30th of November and the 1st of December. Registrations are still open. Um, and just to attend, it's the $150 membership to Escalite plus $25 to attend. So um, I know there are um, about 50 presentations, a great keynote. And there's also, uh, for anybody interested in academic integrity, there is a pre-conference uh, workshop um, on the Monday morning at nine o'clock with Turn It In. So uh, they'll be running a an online workshop. They need 30 people in the workshop to make it viable. So it's a separate free registration uh, on top of your normal registration. You have to register separately for it. So please go and uh, check that out. Um, it's going to be a fantastic conference as usual. Um, and I know the keynote is uh, is going to be very, very interesting. And for our SIG, if you have any suggestions for a SIG event, please do post it again on the MS Team site so that we can take it further. Looking forward to catching you all up there. I think we can stop recording now, Sandy.